Mark 10, chapter, uh, Mark 10 uh, verses 32 to 45. And this is kind of one of the pinnacle points in Mark's gospel, and it's really the last verse, verse 45, is the theme of the whole gospel. And uh, Mark tries to get this point across in several different places, as I'll mention in my sermon, uh, but this is where he becomes very clear about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And uh, so, uh, everybody, I don't have the page, what's the page number in the Bible? 716. 716 in your pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. And uh, this is a familiar story, but it's always one to remember as we talk about leadership and uh, service in the life of the church. Listen now to the word of God. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. This was heading into Easter week. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. <coughs> and Jesus said to them, Of the cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called, to them, him, and called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds to the truth and the glories of your word that we might live it and that we might share it with those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the day that we ordain and install new officers, there's a big question. What makes for a good Christian leader? What kind of people can make an impact in this world uh, or their church for the kingdom of God? We believe we've got some good ones here today, and we've got other good ones who have served here before, and some of you may assume this role sometime in the future. And there are lots of books written about Christian leadership at all levels, and it's a main feature of Mark's gospel. But it's not how the world views leadership. When the world views leadership, they often look at somebody's appearance or their charm or their speaking ability or something like that. And those are useful characteristics to a degree. Our politicians generally run on those kind of uh, qualifications. But that's not how Christian leaders are to be measured. The bottom line for us is we follow the pattern of Jesus. We become a disciple. We live like he did and he would today. Now, Mark goes to great lengths to bring out what good leadership is about in his gospel. In fact, there are three passages in particular that follow a similar pattern uh, in successive chapters in Mark's gospel. In Mark 8, in Mark 9, in Mark 10, you see very similar instances going on. It's the same pattern. The disciples are on a journey with Jesus. And Jesus turns and begins to tell them what it means for him to fulfill his role as the Messiah. And that means going to Jerusalem, being betrayed, uh, being crucified, being executed, and sealed in a tomb. And then he always gives good news at the end. After three days, he will rise. Now, 
Now, the disciples, for whatever reason, misunderstand what Jesus means by this. They blow it off. They don't understand it. They just think this is some kind of weird talk from their master. And so in each of these three instances, they come back to Jesus and show that they've missed the point altogether. And so then Jesus has to gather the group or even a larger group around him and straighten them out and tell them what it really means to be a follower in his kingdom and what the leaders especially should be like. In Mark 8, the first of these predictions is where Jesus and the disciples are heading to the very north end of Israel at Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asks him, who do you say that I am? Peter figures out you are the Christ. And uh, Jesus pats him on the back. Then he says, okay, if I'm the Christ, this is what it means. I've got to go to Jerusalem, be turned over to the Gentiles, be executed, die, and rise three days later. And Peter pulls up and says, no, no, none of this kind of talk. Uh, uh, we can't have any of this. And then Jesus turns and rebukes him publicly and says, get behind me, Satan. You're not on the side of God, but the side of men. And he turns to his, uh, the rest of the disciples. Whoever would come after me, he must first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For what will it profit a man to gain uh, the whole world but lose his life or his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his life or his soul? Uh, whoever is ashamed of me in this crooked and gen uh, sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the angels? That's the first one of these instances. So Jesus starts off there. Now in chapter 9, the pattern repeats. This time, uh, they're traveling in Galilee. And Jesus tells them exactly what it means. Well, he's got to go back to Jerusalem, and there will be turned over, tried, and executed, and rise to life. So what do the disciples do? They get into an argument over which of them is the greatest. So Jesus just has to shake his head and says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And then he pulls a child into their midst and says, whoever receives a child receives me. Meaning whoever takes care of the lowliest, the weakest, the poorest in the community, uh, that's the person who receives me. And here in chapter 10, they're on the road to Jerusalem, heading into Easter and Passover. And Jesus predicts all those events of Holy Week. And it's very clear that he knows exactly what's going to happen. Got to remember, Jesus didn't die and get crucified by accident. It was the plan of God, and he went willingly to take on the sins of the world and relieve us from all of our spiritual burdens. And so he makes it real clear. So what did the disciples do? In the persons of James and John, they come to Jesus and ask that loaded question. Master, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Has anybody ever come to you and asked that question? Mothers, how many of your kids have ever asked you that question? Our fathers, how many of your kids have asked you that question? Our spouses, how many of you have had your husband or wife come to you and say, we do whatever I ask of you? What does that usually imply? Uh, you're getting set up, aren't you? Somebody's after something big time, and they want the guarantee that you're going to do it. Up front. And of course, Jesus is suspicious uh, from the start here. What do you want me to do for you? And they say, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. We want the chief seats. Will you take power? I want to be your right hand man. He wants to be your left hand man. We want to be up with you and have the power and control and share it with you do. And we want to have all the servants and people coming and bowing down and waiting on us and taking care of our needs. Sounds like a good gig, doesn't it? But is that what Jesus was going to set up in Jerusalem? Was he going to be a political ruler? Was he going to replace Roman authority with his authority? No. Uh, he came for a whole different meaning and purpose. And so he talks to them. Do you, you know what you're getting into? Can you drink what cup that I'm going to drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? And, of course, they think they can. They think they're really... Uh, Hot stuff here. And uh, so Jesus had to set them straight. The greatest must be the least of all. And uh, 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 whoever would be first must be the slave of all. That's what it gives you. And this ends with the theme of Mark's gospel. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what the gospel of Mark's all about. Jesus came to be the suffering servant who took on the burdens of the world. And we are called to go out in his name and take on the burdens of the world and serve others 
with his life giving uh, commitment, love, and passion. Now, we don't redeem the world quite the same way he does. Uh, we don't have to die for the sins of the world. We give our lives in devotion to him, knowing that God has raised us from the dead, and we can work towards the benefit of others. Now, this gives us some great points for Christian leadership here this morning. And I'll pull some of these from Mark's gospel and then add a couple of others uh, that are uh, obvious ones from Scripture and other places as well. Uh, let's look at here. First of all, Christian values are the opposite of the world's values. And this is one thing that we're all wrestling with in the culture wars and denominational wars and other things like that. Uh, we've got to choose one or the other. We're going to walk with Jesus. We're going to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, as Mark 8 says, or we're going to just become like everybody else in the world. And uh, the world's standard is the person at the pinnacle of the pyramid, the Donald Trumps of the world, and other people like him. It's how many people does he have under him holding him up? And that's not a criticism of Donald Trump. That's just how the secular world out there operates. And whether it's Steve Jobs or the president of General Motors or whatever you want to have out there, who is at the pinnacle? Who has the most people under him? <coughs> well, in God's kingdom, it's turned upside down. It's the inverted pyramid. The great person in God's kingdom is the person who upholds many others and has their needs and their burdens carried on their shoulders. Uh, that's the way God's kingdom works. But the, it's all turned upside down from the way of the world. And that's what's important. And this is what our officers need to remember today. We're not here to serve you. You're here to serve the needs of other people and uh, to look out for them and to help them as best you can. So everything is turned upside down here. And two, service is the paramount mark of a good Christian leader. Service to others, not service to to self. A servant, obviously, is somebody who takes on the task and duties assigned to them by others around them. And uh, it's what Jesus uses as the model here. Of course, this is the lowest person in the social order. The only people lower than a servant would be children uh, in uh, that ancient society. That's why Jesus used a child here. And children were to kind of be pushed away and ignored until suddenly they became adults, uh, magically, somehow, or something like that. But here, uh, Jesus is saying, this is the lowest role you can have, but it is, in my eyes, it's the most important. It's the opposite of the people who are the rulers of the world. Um, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. That's pretty clear, isn't it? <laughs> but it shall not be so among you. This isn't the way Jesus wants it to go in the kingdom of God. He wants us to look out for others around us and not expect them to wait on us. The third principle is not about fame, glory, or power. The chiefs seats. James and John wanted the perks of worldly power. But in God's kingdom, that's not what you get. Now, you can turn on the TV and find preachers that are rolling in the dough right now and think that that's the, the mark of a godly life, how much money they make and how much, uh, uh, how big the programs of their church are and things like that. It's okay to be a big church if you're a faithful church, but it's not about pain, fame and power and glory. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. Um, now, the other disciples, when they got word of what James and John asked for, they became rather indignant about this, Mark says here. And the reason why they were indignant was not so much that they thought James and John were off base, but they were mad that James and John beat them to the question. And they got to ask for the chief seats first before they could get up there and ask for the chief seats. And that's why Jesus just has to shake his head and uh, say, no, this isn't the way it's going to go. There are different standards here in my kingdom. And this is what his life and ministry is about. And Mark has kind of an unflattering view of the, gospel, of the disciples, but they always had problems grasping this important rule in the kingdom. And part of that is his theology, in that you can't really understand who Jesus is 
till you see him suffering and dying on the cross. And that's why the centurion stands there and says to the whole world, truly this man is the son of God. And that's kind of Mark's uh, unveiling of Jesus for, who he, for full, who he fully is. And that's when we can really understand what it means to be his follower. And then, of course, he's raised from the dead after that to vindicate his life and teachings at Easter. Um, but here in Christ's kingdom, serving means laying aside your desires, taking up a cross, a particular burden or mission, and then going with Jesus, even to the cup and baptism that he drank on the cross. And today there are Christians, they say it's every, uh, about a Christian being killed every 24 hours in the world today. Uh, somebody is laying down their life uh, for their faith. That Christianity is now uh, the most persecuted faith in the world. And that's a real tragic situation. Uh, and we need to stand with our brothers and sisters around the world who are under persecution. But some of that's even beginning to creep into our situation here, where if you stand up for biblical values, as we've discussed many times, you too will be criticized and told you're being mean, bigoted, hateful, whatever. Uh, simply for standing up for what Jesus taught us to do. Well, that's the burden that we have to bear today. Jesus expects us to be faithful to him, even if there is a social cost. Now, another lesson here is that humility goes a long way. Don't assume the perks and privileges are for you, but realize uh, are that you're unnaturally strong, like James and John thought that they were, uh, when they didn't really understand the full picture of who Jesus is or what his mission was. And so they got embarrassed here. And I'm sure later in their lives, after Jesus rose from the dead, this was a passage they kind of went, ooh, hey, I remember that moment. That was one of my worst moments back there when we had Jesus with us. Uh, and so they learned uh, a, a lesson there. And then a final point here is leaders can't expect anyone else to do what they are not willing to do. That's the point of being a servant. We've got to be willing to take on whatever roles or tasks are needed in the life of the church. And this is what a good leader does. See something that needs to be done, they either do it themselves, or they organize a group saying, that's a ministry we need to put together in the life of our church to address. So whether it's taking care of things here, reaching out to our community, or taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, good leaders want to make sure that that happens and they're willing to step in and do their part. And uh, again, Jesus symbolized this in uh, chapter uh, uh, nine by putting the child in their midst saying, you know, if you can't take care of a little child and that child's needs, then you really can't take care of anything else. Uh, you've got to take care of the weakest before God will let you take care of the strongest. Well, that's Mark's summary, and you can add to this some other things. The law of love, love one another. By this, all the world will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus said that in John 13. There's the joy of the Lord. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. It's fun and meaningful and enriching to serve God's people. It's not drudgery. Faithfulness is a key component to you. You carry out the duties you are assigned to do or volunteer to do, and you don't let personality conflicts or differences of opinions with other folks in the church get in the way. You model how other people follow Jesus. You also confess your failures when they come along. You will make mistakes. I will make mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes this year, so we need to ask for forgiveness at some point. We need to not be too proud to do that. And then finally, if we're all going to be making mistakes, we need to forgive one another. I've preached about this lately, that it's a key component of the Christian life. Others will let you down at times, just as you let them down at times. But be as charitable to them as you want them to be towards you, or you are even towards yourself. The way we forgive each other and take care of each other that marks the ways of the Christian community. Well, let me wrap this up. These are not just for our new officers. They're for any leader in the church or any good church member to try and embody to some degree. They apply to us all. We are called to serve one another in Jesus' name, each and every one of us here today and all the folks who aren't here with us today, this is an obligation that falls upon them. We are all called to take care of the needs of the church and reach out in the name of Jesus to reach our community. 
We're called to love and to forgive and to be patient with one another. When we put that into practice, what happens? When a church truly loves and forgives and works together in a joyful and harmonious way, it's seen as an example of the kingdom of God in the world and proof that God is really alive and well in that congregation. And I believe we really experienced this here lately in the life of our church, and we will continue to work together in this way as we move forward. This is what pleases God most of all when we set our hearts and minds towards knowing and serving him. Let us do that today, remembering the words of Jesus. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Go and follow the ways of Jesus and be willing to serve the needs of the world around you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love and blessings of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And he set an example for us, and he equips us to go forth and take care of the needs of our fellow believers sitting around us here today and those uh, out there in our community who do not know your love and grace and mercy. Use us all for that purpose, and especially our new officers, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.